it can be reaching out for support when it feels difficult to ask for help, right? It's allowing ourselves to feel our emotions. It, it literally doesn't have to be going to the spa, right? And I think, again, social media, society has normalized this whole like, oh yeah, you know, self-care just means like the spa and getting a massage and all of that. Self-care can literally be cultivating the normalcy to enjoy laughter, song and dance, right? Just letting go of being in control, turning on a good playlist and you know, listening to it as you do the laundry and just that you're like instant pick me up. Like just allowing yourself to be a human being, living a human experience and feel all the feels. So self-care doesn't have to be this like elaborate dramatic thing. It could literally be, you know, taking deep breaths and reminding yourself and gentle reminders, creating like you know, things that you can look out for that are resources for you to remind yourself to take better care of yourself. Hi, and welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast, episode number 103. So today I want to revisit a topic that we've talked about on here before, and that is the concept of the good enough mom or the good enough mother. And first I want to define what the good enough mom is and the origin of that. And then we're going to talk about some tips that you can leverage this concept in your own motherhood journey. And as a working mom, how can you make this, you know, something that works for you? Hey mama, you deserve a life free of overwhelm and burnout. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. I'm your host, life and mindset coach, Shiro Bergbauer. I'm also a wife, mom, and CRNA. This is the podcast for high-achieving mamas in medicine like you and I. Together, we'll learn how to navigate the ups and downs of working motherhood. If you're looking to thrive in your relationships and overcome overwhelm in your motherhood, marriage, and medicine, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. What is the good enough mother? So the concept of the good enough mother was first introduced by a British psychoanalyst, Dr. D.W. Winnicott. And what he basically believed was that a good enough mom is one who provides the necessary physical and emotional care for her child, but who is not perfect or infallible. And so in other words, the good enough mother is a mom who meets her child's needs most of the time, but may occasionally make mistakes or fall short in some areas. So according to Dr. Winnicott, it's important for a mom to provide a sense of security and continuity for her child and to create an environment in which the child feels safe and feels also very safe to explore and learn. So this requires the mom to be attuned to her child's needs and to be responsive to them to them while also setting appropriate limits and boundaries. So one of the, you know, core foundational attachment needs is attunement, and that is for a child to feel seen and heard. And so when you think about attunement, it's that you can be attuned and you're responsive to your child's needs, but you also set appropriate limits and boundaries. So one of the things that is important, and you know, for many people, good enough sometimes represents you know, settling. And what I want to make very clear is that the concept is not meant to lower the standards of parenting, but rather the concept is created to acknowledge that no parent is perfect and that children can still thrive even when their parents make mistakes. I want to reiterate that. Children can still thrive even when their parents make mistakes. So the goal of good enough parenting is to provide a supportive and nurturing environment that allows your children to develop a sense of self and to build resilience in the face of challenges. So when you think about that, right, and leveraging that, what I first want to talk about is perfection. And what does perfection even have to do with this topic? And I think it's important for us to just know that First of all, when we let go of perfection, we cultivate self-compassion. And there's a quote by Anna Quinn Linden that says, the thing that is really hard and really amazing is giving up on being perfect and beginning the work of becoming yourself. 
So one of the things to remember is that perfection really is not self-improvement. I think sometimes we're like, oh, you know, self-improvement is if I get to perfection, I have improved as a person and this is the goal of mindset work and this is the goal of growing as a person. Perfectionism is not self-improvement. At its core, according to Brene Brown, perfectionism is about trying to earn approval and acceptance. So most people who are perfectionists were raised that be, being praised for achieving and performing, it could be, you know, good grades, good manners, following rules, people pleasing, their appearance, their, you know, you know, their their sports abilities, all of that. And somewhere along the way, we start to adopt this dangerous and debilitating belief system that I am what I accomplish and how well I accomplish it. So it goes like this, I have to please, I have to perform, and I have to be perfect. The difference between self-focused healthy striving is that we it goes against the grain of perfectionism, perfectionism because we're thinking, how can I improve? That is the thought process behind good enough parenting versus perfectionist, which is what will they think? I was coaching a client recently and we were having a conversation about just sometimes how society and social media and societal expectations and standards and expectations from our families can create this very unrealistic view of our own kids. And so what the conversation was about was that she has a daughter who is more on the introverted side of things. So she's a teenager, she's introverted. And so my friend, you know, she's my client, she sees these people, their friends, their family friends, their kids are her daughter's age doing outgoing stuff. They are in sports and they are thriving in whatever and their friend circles are big and her thought process is, oh my gosh, I want my daughter to be like all these other kids. And it's more driven by what will other people think if my daughter doesn't perform this way, if my daughter doesn't have a big circle of friends. And that actually does get in the way of us with our self-compassion because we start to compare ourselves with other people. We start to be like, oh, but you know, how am I going to be accepted and how am I going to belong? The other thing about perfectionism that I want to make very clear is that it's not the same as striving to be at our best, right? It's not about healthy achievement and growth. It's the belief that if we are perfect or if we look perfect and we act perfect, that people will like not really judge us or blame us so we can minimize or avoid the pain of blame, judgment, and shame. So it really acts as a shield because we're like, oh, we just walk around and we protect ourselves and we try to be these perfect moms and, you know, we do all the things and we are Pinterest worthy. And what is interesting is when you lay down the shield and you acknowledge good enough mothering, right? You're picking up your life. When you lay down that shield that you've been lugging around along, you know, wanting to be perfect, you actually create room for success. And research actually shows that perfectionism hinders success. In fact, perfectionism is often the path to depression, anxiety, addiction, and life paralysis. And what is life paralysis? It's really when we miss out on opportunities because we're too afraid to put anything out in the world that is less than perfect. So it's the fear of B plus work. So we're like, if we don't do A plus work, we're not going to put it out in the world. So it hampers us from, you know, creativity. It hampers us, us from showing up as our best and the version that we were created to be. So when we don't, you know, follow our dreams because of our deep fear of failing or making mistakes or disappointing people, of course that life paralysis will happen. And it's terrifying to risk something when you're a perfectionist because it puts your self-worth on the line. And so just remember these four things. Perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels the thought that if we look perfect, live perfect, work perfect, and do everything perfectly, we can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. It's also self-destructive because there is no such thing as perfect. It's an unattainable goal, and it's more about perception. There is no way we can control what people think of us. Third, perfectionism is addictive because 
when we do try to be perfect, we will experience shame, judgment, and blame. So we start thinking it's because we're not good enough. And so we like just go down that like hole of trying to be over and over again. Number four is something that I drive this point home to my clients all the time. Feeling shamed, judged, and blame, or the fear of feeling shame, judged, and blame are realities of the human experience. And perfectionism actually increases the odds that we'll experience shame, judgment, and blame. Because if we experience that, then we start to blame ourselves because we're like, oh, it's all my fault that I feel this way and I feel this way because I'm not good enough. So in order for us to even have, have, like overcome perfectionism, we have to be able to acknowledge our vulnerabilities to be aware that the universal experience of shame, judgment, and blame is going to happen. So we have to develop shame resilience and practice self-compassion, which brings me to what are some ways that we can leverage this concept of good enough motherhood in our parenting? One is by prioritizing quality time over quantity time. So as working moms, there's this idea that we don't spend enough time with our children and we feel guilt about it. And we start to like, almost like prioritize quantity instead of quality. And so what we can do differently is allowing ourselves to be fully present when we are able to be with our children. So is it, you know, being fully present at breakfast, putting the phone down in the morning and having a conversation before bedtime, connecting with your child before they go to bed or on the weekend, like can you put away your phone and other distractions and focus on connecting with your child for a minimum of 15 minutes? just trying to prioritize that it again it is quality time over quantity time number two like i said before is practicing self-compassion right so when we can cultivate self-compassion we start to like notice when perfectionism is getting in the way right if we are trying to be you know perfect we have to realize that it's impossible to be perfect. When we give ourselves permission to make mistakes and we nurture that self-compassion for ourselves, then we can be kind to ourselves and in return we're able to be kind to our children. So one of, you know, one of the things I like to reiterate is the qualities of self-compassion are self-kindness, right? Being kind to ourselves, reminding ourselves that inner chatter, that we're not doing a good job, that we should be perfect, that we should strive to be at this unattainable standard, giving ourselves permission to be like, nope, I just want to be good enough. Two is that concept of self-compassion as universal understanding of common shared humanity. The more I talk to moms, the more I try to drive home the point that we all deal with shame and judgment and guilt. And sometimes we think we're the only ones. And sometimes we're like, but it's only me. And I'm going to go on a little side note here. One of the reasons why I was so you know, committed to creating a community for moms and to create it in a container that feels safe and offers you know, support, which is um, the mom club or the smart mama club, as I have decided to name it. And I'll give you some more details about that at the end of the podcast. One of the things that I want to create in this community is the awareness of common shared humanity. When you can come into the container in the group and hear another mom being coached on her feelings of shame, her feelings of guilt, her feelings of, you know, judgment and, and all the things that surround parenting, then you can have this aha, like, oh, it's not just me. I'm not the only one going through this. We are all in this boat together. We are all struggling together, right? We are all trying our best. We are all trying to transform our lives from the information we have at the time. And so when we think about creating empathy in that space, we can also feel sympathy for the person while cultivating our own empathy and empathy towards them. So that was one of my goals of creating the Smart Mama Club was that I wanted us to all have the understanding of, oh, we're not the only one. We are in this boat together. We are going to make mistakes. We are going to have universal struggles, but we can connect, right? And the, uh, the third part of it is mindfulness and self-compassion. It's being aware in the present moment 
to practice compassion, especially in a culture where we are either blaming ourselves or blaming other people and running away from emotions that feel super uncomfortable. So just to kind of like remind yourself is self-compassion involves self-kindness. It involves awareness of shared humanity. And it also involves mindfulness, being in the here and now, you know, being able to cultivate that awareness and love for ourselves. Number three is asking for help, right? And I will continue to talk about this all the time on this podcast is that I know that asking for help can feel very difficult. It can feel very pressured. It can feel very out of character for us, especially as women who are high achieving, we've accomplished so much, a lot of it without asking for external support. But it's always important to remember that you can't and you don't have to do it alone, right? Whether it's hiring support, right? Hiring a nanny, hiring a babysitter, asking your partner for support, leaning on friends and support systems that you have available and family. It's okay for you to ask for help when you need it. I was thinking about last year, my daughter had a tonsillectomy. We were in the hospital for one night. We came home and, you know, they had warned us it was a full total tonsillectomy. So they had warned us like day 10 is going to be crazy. It's going to be wild. And so we were like waiting for it. And so it happened. It was a Saturday night. We got zero sleep. She was so uncomfortable. She was hurting a lot. We had been given a like steroid dose to give her in that like just to help her through it. So of course she got better. She slept the rest of the night. We were so tired. My husband and I, we were like exhausted. She woke up. The steroids were doing their thing. And she was like active and she was doing the most and my friend Juni offered to like take her for the day it was so amazing because I literally was just like in the group chat text I was like oh my god I'm on the struggle bus like we didn't get any sleep last night and she was like oh have her come over and play with my son and so she went over played the whole day my husband and I got to nap it was blissful right and it just for me was just being able to go to my friends and say I need help please help me. I can't do this today. I cannot mom today. I just, I need your support, right? So being able to ask for help. I was talking to a friend yesterday. We were hosting a baby shower and we we were like giving advice to the couple. And the, the thing I wrote down was, don't be afraid to reach out for help, right? There will be people who are literally waiting to help you. But also for us as moms and in, in building community, let's normalize offering help to each other, right? Like, let's normalize, oh, I can see the person might be on the struggle bus. How can I support her? One of the things that I think has been a profound change in who I am and how I show up as a person is creating capacity for people to be able to ask me to support them in the communities that I'm in and also being able to practice awareness of people's vulnerabilities and awareness of people's needs. And so, you know, if you ever just like, you know, are having a moment and you're like, I just need to bounce this off another human being, please, 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 please feel free to reach out. I will support you and hold space for you as best as I can. Or I will point you to the resources that will create even more support for you. Tip number four is prioritizing self-care. Again, this is something I talk about all the time. And I know it's easy to put yourself on the back burner when you're a working mom, right? Like trying to juggle all the balls. But prioritizing your self-care is essential for your mental and physical health and well-being, which means cultivating and creating time for rest, for moving your body in whatever form exercise looks like for you, eating healthy, and participating in activities that bring you joy. Because when you do take care of yourself, you're better able to parent and take better care of your child. And, you know, as I think of self-care, and I think self-care also does come with practicing, like, the recognition of our needs and also knowing that my self-care might not look the same as your self-care and that's really okay, right? And self-care can even be making decisions not to compare yourself with other moms. It can be speaking your truth and speaking powerfully when you feel that you need to do that, right? It can be reaching out for support when it feels difficult to ask for help, right? It's 
allowing ourselves to feel our emotions. It, it literally doesn't have to be going to the spa, right? And I think, again, social media, society has normalized this whole like, oh yeah, you know, self-care just means like doing, you know, going to you know, the, the, you know, the spa and getting a massage and all of that. Self-care can literally be cultivating the normalcy to enjoy laughter, song and dance, right? Just letting go of being in control, turning on a good playlist and, you know, listening to it as you do the laundry and just that you're like instant pick me up, like just allowing yourself to be a human being, living a human experience, and feel all the feels. So self-care doesn't have to be this like elaborate, dramatic thing. It could literally be, you know, taking deep breaths and reminding yourself and gentle reminders, um, creating like, you know, things that you can look out for that are resources for you to remind yourself to take better care of yourself. This past year, I started paying closer attention to my metabolic health and my health in general and so and this is not at all sponsored it's just something that actually my friend Jessica got me into I signed up for the levels app and in levels they give you access to a continuous glucose monitor so you monitor your blood sugar and one of the things I started to pick up on is my blood sugar starts to rise when I'm stressed and you know like even though I haven't eaten anything, like I can notice the impact of stress and stressors on my body and I can pay closer attention to my own movement and how I eat and the things that I eat, what I decide to nourish my body with, certain foods that create, you know, a glucose spike. And I know I was already like conscious of the fact that I may be leaning towards insulin resistance. And so, you know, I was trying all the things to lose weight and get to a certain weight and I was really struggling. And so, you know, having that like real time information has been so impactful for me, but I truly consider it a self care because one of the things that my um, levels app will tell me, like they'll say, oh, your blood sugar is spiking. Do you want to, you know, move your body a little bit? Do you want to go for a walk? And so it gives me real time awareness. The second thing that I started earlier this year actually was um, something that was provided by my life coach Brig in our coaching container. Uh, our group coaching, it's called Deeply Rooted. It's an amazing coaching space for black women. And she gave us access to the aura ring. And so I have an aura ring, O-U-R-A, and I wear this ring 24-7. Um, and I know there are people who have opinions about wearing devices all the time. I This is a choice that I have made because I want to monitor my health and my stress levels. And one of the biggest data points that you get from the aura ring is your heart rate variation. And there's been studies to show like, you know, the impact of heart rate variation and how your body is managing stress. And so I love to have that information. I'm also very, 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 very clear on my sleep and getting rest. And I do sleep more than the average human being. And I'm okay with that. I go to bed at around 8 p.m. And I will sleep till you know, 5 a.m. So I get a minimum of nine hours every night. I know that's not for everybody, but that's just something that works for me. And so having the aura ring, like give me sleep staging information, you know, am I getting deep sleep? Um, so like, I'll just like share an insight from last night. So last night I got nine hours and seven minutes of total sleep. I was in bed for nine hours and 25 minutes. And by the way, please don't use this data to compare yourself. I'm just like giving you some insight. And so out of that, like my REM sleep was four hours and 18 minutes. I had an hour of deep sleep and deep sleep is super important as far as like regenerating cells and all of that. So even when the nights I sleep eight hours, like I still want to see that data and see like, and it's helped me like monitor like, oh, when am I, like if I have a glass of wine on the weekend, my deep sleep is impacted. So that for me has just been basic self-care that is just collecting data points. Like, oh, I can in real time go, yeah, maybe a glass of wine doesn't actually like help me relax, even though I was drinking it to like, you know, spend the evening with my husband and we had dinner and I had a glass of wine at dinner. It didn't help me relax. In fact, it created worse sleep for me. So that can be your self-care. It can literally be just be like monitoring the things that help your body, that help you, you know, show up at your best. Um, and the one thing that I feel like I have so much work to do is movement and exercise. It just doesn't come naturally for me. And so I don't consider exercise self-care because I'm like, I literally have to have so many mental conversations with myself 
about exercise. And so it could be for you. It could be something that you consider self-care. Like, um, you know, I have a client who she is obsessed with her, her Oculus and the VR headset. And she does a lot of like, there's one called Supernova and she like does those exercises. And she's actually gotten me interested in that because it doesn't feel like work. Another, speaking of Oculus, one of the ways that I will sometimes like kind of just like, you know, re-exit the current experience and practice like 10 minutes of self-care is that like National Geographic and a couple of more sites have like these tours that you can take. And I'll tell you a funny story. I started to like do these tours where I'm like, oh, I want to see like what the village that I grew up in looks like. And I'll go on there and it will be like a Google like tour, but I just like, it's like a way, like almost like Calgon, take me away. It's like my little, like, you know, I'm going to escape the reality for now for like 10, 15 minutes. So there are so many ways you can practice micro self-care. And in fact, I do have a one week self-care challenge where you get like these five minute micro self-care tips every week. Uh, I will link the sign up for that. If you're interested in that, I will link the sign up for that in the show notes. So you have access to that. Finally, tip number five, and I know I went into it very, very hard at the beginning, is embrace imperfection. It is so important for you to remember that no one is perfect and that's okay. And embrace the imperfections of yourself, of your partner, and of your children. And instead, focus on creating loving, supporting, and nurturing environment that allows your children to thrive. I was talking about my client earlier and her daughter is an introvert. And one of the things I shared with her is that you know, when we actually like meet our children and their perceived imperfections where they are, I think it creates room for us to connect better with them because we're able to see them as the person they're presenting themselves to be and not the person that we want them to be. And so I've talked about the gifts of imperfections here in the past, and I just want to kind of reiterate them. And these are courage, compassion, and connection, right? So courage, again, comes from the heart, and it is the idea of you know, showing up and being able to go against the grain and do things from your heart and love people as they are and accept yourself as you are, right? And then compassion, again, it's self-compassion and compassion towards other people. The third aspect of imperfection is connection, right? We are all wired for connection. We are all wired to connect with other people and we're all wired to create meaningful relationships, but we also are wired to sometimes take time away from ourselves. So Brene Brown defines connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. And so if you feel connected to somebody, that is true connection. One of the things that we sometimes forget is not all friendships create connection. We can actually start to scan our environment for that and sometimes again we are the toxic person in the friendships and that's also normal to like recognize and accept and it's part of emotional maturity but sometimes when we are you know when we are noticing that we're disconnected right we may also just sometimes think that we are connected but we're not so like for example Technology has created this environment that we feel like we're connected to people. We feel like we know people because, you know, we we may find ourselves spending more time on Facebook and Instagram than we are spending in real time with other people. I have a friend who like was very much like we would be at a party and they would be on like social media. And we had like a little come to Jesus where it was like, hey, it feels very uncomfortable that you're not here with us, you're like here with the people on the internet. And those are hard conversations to have. But I think that there's space in relationships to express that, like, you know, where you are aware of like how you're not or connecting or how you're disconnecting from people, right? And one of the barriers to connection is that, especially in American culture, is the cultural importance we place on going it alone, right? So we start to equate success with not needing other people and while people are willing to help us sometimes we feel like if we're if we don't achieve the goal by ourselves like it's less meaningful right and so I just want to offer like as far as connection again it's one of the reasons I created the mom club because I feel that we cannot go it alone I think motherhood is a journey that requires such wholehearted connection and I would really 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 my goal is to build community that places this at the forefront and really like cultivates that. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the mom club now that I have given you the tips. So the mom club is launching in March this month. You can find out more details by going to smartmamacoaching.com forward slash store. And what the mom club is going to be, it's it's going to be a monthly membership while you can also sign up for annual membership. It's going to cost $99 a month to be in the membership. If you pay annually, it's, you get a discount. I believe it's a $200 discount. It's $9.99 for the year. So what do you get in this membership? One, you get bi-monthly 90-minute group coaching calls or basically what it is is you will come on the call and you can either send a, an email ahead of time on the topic that you want to get coached. You're going to get coached. If you don't get coached or you don't have you know a question to be coached about, I think there's so much value in the separation of like somebody's getting coached on something you may be struggling with and hearing the coaching that they receive and the feedback they're getting and then going out and applying that in your own life. And, you know, as part of building community, it's creating that safety for people to show up and be willing to share their vulnerabilities and express themselves and feel supported. You will also get a module of the month. So like the first month, we're going to start on like mindset management and I'm going to share the tools that I use to coach my clients, but I will also give you some tools to help your own work as far as coaching yourself outside of our coaching calls. And so you will be able to like access that. Our first Smart Mama group coaching call is going to be on March 27th. And so on that call, we will like just kind of touch base on the again the mind module of the month which will be mindset for the first month and then we will coach on whoever needs to be coached we'll answer any questions you might have the other thing is that I know how hard it is for moms to be like oh I'm gonna do this thing that requires me to like do a course and sign up so you will have video modules on an app but what I want to provide for you is a private podcast that you will be able to like listen to the module of the month through, right? You will be able to replay the coaching calls on. And this is a private podcast again. So every person will have their individual access. They'll be able to like access that information. The other thing that I talked about more is community and building that community, creating space for us to connect on a different level where we can come and share our collective struggle, but we can also share our collective wins. So we will have like, you know, a post of the week where we will share any wins and it could literally be, you can ask my clients, like we celebrate in this membership, like in my coaching one-on-ones where I'm like, my client is like, I got my kid to eat veggies this week. That's a win, right? I was able to get two workouts in this week. That's a win. The goal is to create a community in which we celebrate each other, we celebrate motherhood, we celebrate being in this collective experience as women. And again, this membership is only open to women and those who identify as women and for the reason of the safety and community and connection. So I would love to have you in the community right now. Again, um, it's live, so you can just go up and sign up. I will include the link in the show notes if you are interested. That will be available for you. So I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for your support. And I can't wait to see you inside the Smart Mama Club. It's going to be epic. Again, like I said, we kick off at the end of March. And it's I am so excited to just share this with you, I think, It's going to be life-changing for so many women and I can't wait. Oh, and I meant to say the group coaching calls are hosted by me and you have access to, you know, the tools that I use with my one-on-one clients. You have access to ask me questions and get support on anything you may be struggling with. I just wanted to create a space that, you know, you guys could, you know, get the same coaching support at a different level and at a different price range as I have received feedback from different women. And it will also be a good way of you getting to know how I work, how I coach. And if then you decide to work with me one-on-one, um, that will be also a way for you to like, you know, get in. Because currently as of March, I don't have any openings for my one-on-one coaching program until the beginning of June. And so I know there's been some of you that have reached out to me and, you know, want to book a consult, which I'm happy to do a consult, but then I don't want to give you this like impression that once we do the consult, we'll start right away. So I wanted to have this available as soon as possible for all of y'all that are waiting to get on a consult. So can't wait to see you inside the Smart Mama Club. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions and 
I'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye now. I'm Shira Bergbauer, and you've been listening to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. New episodes are out every Monday. These episodes are created by me, Shira Bergbauer, and produced by Cassidy Mitchell. If you enjoyed this show or found it helpful, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts. The concepts I share on this podcast resonate with you or you're ready to change your relationships and mindset, I can help you. If you'd like in-depth, personalized support, I'd love to invite you to apply for my Life and Mindset Coaching Program. Just imagine you and I every week working together as I teach you the tools to up-level your life. To book your free one-hour consultation call, go to www.stethoscopestoswaddles.com forward slash consultation. You're doing a great job, Mama. Have a great week. Bye now.